Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matlock, and this is our co-host, Dr. Allison Tricondi of Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. Today, we are here with Noemi El Haddad. Noemi is an associate professor and co-interim chair of the Columbia University Department of Biomedical Informatics. She is a researcher for the organization Citizen Endo and the app Fendo, which is at the forefront of the intersection of machine learning, technology, and medicine. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to hear more about all of this incredible research that you've been doing. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so can you first tell us how you got started in this work with endometriosis research? Sure, so my research is on artificial intelligence, machine learning applied to health problems. And uh, for many years I had been thinking about the fact that there is some research happening in endometriosis, but in fact, we still have so much to learn about the condition and also we also have so much to learn about the patients themselves uh, who experience the disease and somehow can't manage to get the right care from their providers or even get the right diagnosis in time. And so um, after I got tenure in my position as a faculty, I decided, okay, this is a good time to start something new and focus on this type of diseases that have been um, ignored by most of the research community and thinking in a different way than traditional research had been done and thinking more about what can I bring as a technologist and a machine learning researcher to the field of endometriosis research. And so, um, you know, this combined with the interest in hearing from the patient very quickly the idea of building an app that can get patients to tell us day to day their experience of disease and us analyzing all of this data at scale became very natural. As a data researcher, can you explain the ways that both clinical data and patient generated data can impact the health of pelvic pain patients? Sure, and that's a great question first of all. Um, so. The clinical data is critical um, on a day-to-day -day basis for providers, right? Like, so as a patient comes, uh, there's a lot of documentation kept in patient records, and providers get to know their patients very well, uh, and that's very uh, helpful to taking care of patients. But once they're outside of their encounters with their providers, patients have all sorts of experiences of uh, pelvic health or disruptions of pelvic health that might be important for their clinicians to know about. Uh, in particular, when it comes to chronic conditions where there's ebbs and flows in the way pain is experienced or other symptoms are, are experienced, it can be useful to have a record of what's going on uh, day to day from the patient's perspective and then bring that record to their clinicians so that together they can identify trends or they can um, detect if there's progression of a particular type of disorder. And can you tell us a little bit about Citizen Endo? Yeah, Citizen Endo is, a, so that's the name we gave to the project um, my, in my lab with my students. The idea is to um, use principles of citizen science, which is this emerging new science that um, proposes for lay individuals to be partners in scientific research. And it's a very intriguing uh, idea where we're saying that together people have interesting questions to ask and can uh, collect data in a different way than scientists usually do. And by working together with scientists, there can be new research discoveries being made. And so it felt like this idea of citizen science fed so well with endometriosis where we have so many questions and patients want to participate in research but feel like they're being left alone. And so citizen endo was kind of like endometriosis, citizen science put together. Um, part of the first study that we made on, in citizen endo was um, what would be the instrument that we would use to collect data uh, in a very reliable fashion directly from patients. And so FENDO was uh, the first kind of big research study that we did as part of Citizen Endo. 
We have other studies that we're doing now, uh, some of them continuing on this idea of patient-generated data. Uh, we've learned since we have started collecting more and more data about our patients that um, they want to in, be involved in science, but they also want to be involved in their care, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and so we are now building uh, additional functionality to the, to the app so that patients can have sh uh, increased shared decision making with their providers, basically. So uh, ways for patients and providers to look and reflect upon the data that's been collected and again, identify all these trends and decide better on what the next steps are. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, as patients with endometriosis have these very complex care teams of different specialists that they deal with, uh, and they have their own life at home uh, happening, this type of data and this type of tools can help them manage all of the team together, but also help them self-manage their condition better. So what have you learned from the data that you've generated thus far? So we so far have about 8,000 participants uh, who come from all over the world, actually. It's very rewarding. Uh, and um, these people are amazing because, first of all, they're using the app very regularly. And so they're enabling us to have this very rich data set that we can analyze. And so we're very, very grateful. They also provide us with questions themselves that they're interested in. Uh, we get a lot of emails from uh, our participants about, you know, I've always wondered about the link between that symptoms that I have. And, you know, I have a bloody nose uh, around ovulation time, and I never understood why. And could this be related to my endometriosis, or is this just a normal, regular menstrual cycle type of thing. And we don't have answers for most of their questions, which really tells us about how little we know about the menstrual cycle, but also endometriosis. Uh, nevertheless, we, the first question we've been focusing on is, what, what are the potential subtypes of endometriosis? As you know, endometriosis is considered to be a fairly prevalent condition. It's estimated to be 10% of women in reproductive age. And so it's probably a heterogeneous condition, meaning that different people might have different ways of experiencing the disease. And so we are trying to identify these subgroups based on the data that they've provided to us. Uh, so far, we've identified three or four potential subgroups that, um, where the disease manifests itself in different ways. Um, but what we find interesting is that no matter which group a patient belongs to, there definitely is a systemic effect of endometriosis where it's not only the pelvis, but also legs and chest and, uh, and you know, various organs, GI, GU organs that are being affected. And it's not only happening during periods, it's happening throughout their cycle if women have a cycle. Uh, but there's definitely symptoms happening outside of period cramps, which are the traditional, you know, first symptom in which uh, patients are told endometriosis manifests itself. I think that is an extremely important point because the classic definition of endometriosis is only bad periods. But clinically, more and more, we're seeing that endometriosis symptoms really can happen outside your cycle. Um, and I think that the data you're collecting is, is just incredible in, in, in making headway and really understanding the disease. So thank you so much. Have you noticed uh, two things, uh, a family history involved with endometriosis? And in addition, have you noticed any genetic predisposition based on where patients live in the world? Right, so I think we don't have enough data yet to look at potential uh, country or region's characteristics and differences amongst the world. Um, so far, just looking very roughly at the people who have been participating in the study, there doesn't seem to be any region-specific uh, you know, increase in severity or anything like that. There definitely are differences in treatment and differences in self-management, uh, depending if we're looking at Europe versus Asia versus the US, for example. Um, but I can't say that we've seen yet something more than that. With respect to um, potential hereditary component of endometriosis, um, we do ask a lot about um, medical history and family history as well. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. There's uh, there's a definite association at the at the population level, meaning all the participants in our study seem to have either a mother, an aunt, or a sister who had been also diagnosed with uh, endometriosis, much more than uh, what should be happening in the in the general population. Um, but what we haven't seen was a specific uh, association from one of this subgroup to the other. So that brings up a lot of questions, obviously, of what next step of, of research we want to do here. But I think there's definitely a hereditary component. Where do you see the future uh, in terms of research and science and data collection? There's so many things we, we want to do and we can do now that we have uh, different types of technologies available. I think this idea of self-tracking and self-monitoring is very intriguing and is becoming more and more feasible for people with chronic diseases in general and especially for uh, women's health, reproductive conditions kind of things. So, you know, right now we're asking participants to self-track, meaning to go and tell us every day, you know, it hurts here, I've taken a drug or, you know, I've exercised today or I ate this thing that I think is not agreeing with me. Um, but we also are interested in things related to their microbiome composition and how it changes through time. We're interested in their heart rhythm and does it change through time and can it help us detect uh, the status of someone uh, with respect to their inflammation level or anything like that. There's all sorts of what we call passive tracking uh, where how mobile is someone when they have a flare of endometriosis or is it actually you know, bedridden and can they go to work? We can measure all of these things through a smartphone. And I think it's gonna, the more of these types of data we collect, the more we'll learn about, one, the burden of this type of disease, but also understand exactly what are the ways in which the disease is experienced. One caveat I'll add to this is that as we collect more and more data, we wanna be very careful with this data. It can be more and more intrusive uh, and so, you know, as researcher, we have a duty to be protective of the data, to make sure that the data stays private and, conf and confidential. Um, but I think, you know, patients and participants in research studies understand that uh, and are willing to, for most of them, to give this data. Great. And are you able to elaborate on the subgroups that you have mentioned? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so the subgroups we've identified, I, I guess let me first tell you that this question of like identifying potential phenotypes of endometriosis is an ongoing, very much active research question in the field. And so far, most of the phenotypes that have been identified are surgical in nature. So we are thinking in terms of like endometrioma versus deep, uh, in, deeply infiltrated versus superficial type of lesions. And those are good ways to characterize patients. Um, but it seems like it doesn't really correlate with the way patients experience the disease. And so we are more interested in, in phenotyping according to signs and symptoms, more external or uh, actually perceived uh, symptoms by the patient. Um, we're finding basically that the groups are you could, you could characterize them as being according to severity of, uh, of their disease. Um, what we find interesting is that the group that has the most severe uh, experiences of pain, and by that I mean the more body locations being impacted, but also the amount of uh, moments in the day where they experience pain, uh, also have severe GI issues like bloating, diarrhea, constipation, urinary issues, difficulty urinating, frequent urination, um, more fatigue, uh, more very basic activities of daily life being impacted, like standing, sitting, you know, uh, they're not exercising, they have very little physical activity, probably because they're in a lot of pain. Um, but these patients are also on the most uh, heavy medications. So they're on um, you know, neuropathic type of medication, they're on opioids a lot, they're on antidepressants. Uh, and then you know, if you, go, you move through the, the spectrum of symptoms, the other groups seem to be having uh, less intensity, but the same amount of, um, of different organs being affected. Um, 
for some of our participants, we see a very, sub, a very clear subgroup where hormonal birth control seems to be working. And there are others who are on progesterone type of birth control, and clearly it's not working for them because they still are experiencing so many symptoms. Another very interesting aspect is, um, is um, all of the pain during and after intercourse. Uh, and we ask very, you know, our, our questions there are very limited, but I think they're still uh, showing a clear signal, which is that this most severe group is avoiding sex uh, completely whereas the others are trying to have sex but reporting a lot of pain. And then we have another group, the more mild, I hesitate to call it mild because they still have a lot of, of symptoms, but they don't report having any um, sexual pain or any problem with uh, sexual intercourse. What's fantastic is you're taking the whole body approach to these patients and collecting and analyzing the data. And I know you're collecting patients' comorbidities. Are there any that stand out in your mind as extremely common comorbidities or associated symptoms in patients? Yeah, we ask, uh, sorry. We, ask, uh, we ask our patients a lot of questions about their comorbidities. And it's interesting because you know, as we know there are problems with diagnosing endometriosis in the first place, we know there's also a few misdiagnoses to, to endometriosis first. So we're trying to take all of these diagnoses with a little of a grain of salt. We're finding for sure that a lot of our patients, I want to say 30 to 40 percent, have a diagnosis, an official diagnosis of IBS, of irritable bowel syndrome. Now, is it really IBS or is it misdiagnosed endometriosis in the first place? Because we know that there's a GI component, I can't tell you exactly, uh, but that's definitely a very frequent um, comorbidity. Then more generally, there are definitely a host of autoimmune conditions that are way more prevalent in this you know, cohort than it is in the general population of women of the same age. So you know, does this mean that there's a link? I don't know, uh, but there definitely are these weird interactions among the conditions. Thank you for being a leader in this really valuable research. And as you touched upon earlier, the participants that you have are so valuable to the research. So for everyone listening, I want you to share with them how they can become an active member of Citizen Endo and the app Fendo. Sure. Uh, yeah, we love our participants. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to them. Um, if you want to be a participant, uh, you can download the app. Uh, it's available for Android phone and iOS, iPhone type of uh, smartphones. And the app itself is a research study. And so when you download the app, you do a consent, uh, just like in a regular research study, where we explain to you what we're trying to find and why we're collecting all of this data how we are keeping track of the data and how secure we're trying to be, which I think we are. We're basically considering all the data uh, like it is a medical record and it's being HIPAA certified um, exactly like medical records. And then we try to kind of uh, leave you alone. We don't want to bug you too much. And so you have a choice in the app to either get daily notifications or not. And you know, if you want to track, that's good and that's better for us. But if you don't want to, you also can not track every day and track whenever you think it makes sense. Um, you know, other than that, we have a Medium uh, blog. Uh, so it's on medium.com, it's a blog site where we try to um, explain the type of research findings that we have as we publish results in the scientific community and try to just um, explain it back to our participants because there is a reason we are able to get the findings. Uh, so I encourage everyone to also look at the blog posts. And just to backtrack for a second, what is the data that people are inputting, the patients are inputting into the app? So it's what they're eating, their activity levels, their pain levels, all of those types of symptoms. Exactly, yeah. There's two types of tracking that someone can, can do uh, every day. One is, uh, you know, kind of like at the end of the day, how was your day? What type of activities were difficult to do? What did you do to self-manage? What type of drugs did you take? And then we have at the moment level, we're very interested in questions like, you know, in the morning, did you have more pain or, or less pain than in the evening? And so there's a way to like, 
uh, at, the, at the level of minutes even, tell us what type of um, acute symptom you, you experienced. And so these are things like pain uh, in different body locations and pain intensity, as well as any GI uh, issues or urinary issues, for instance. And in addition to this research being so helpful for you guys and so valuable, it's also really valuable for patients because often when you have a chronic illness, you forget certain things that may trigger your pain or cause a flare up. So it's really helpful to have this recorded data and this recorded information as to when you were feeling good, when you weren't feeling as good, and perhaps what may have caused that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's a clear uh, set of triggers for people with chronic diseases and endometriosis as well, uh, but these triggers are very personalized. And so it's hard to tell, right, unless you really record it, as you said, to know what's going on. The other way in which patients are telling us they like the app is that they find it to be very validating for them. Uh, you know, these are patients who often had years and years of trying to justify their pain to their providers and convince people that they're not imagining their symptoms, these are real. And somehow as they're tracking them, they're able to you know, reflect upon them and see them you know, listed in front of them. And it feels like, yeah, there's definitely a pattern here. I didn't imagine that. Uh, and so that's another way in which we think the app is very helpful. Yeah, I, I see it in every day in that clinical care. And it's so powerful for patients to really see uh, their improvement, or if they are having a flare, it's real, validating their flare. And I always explain to patients in this realm, when patients do improve, it's a decrease in frequency and intensity of the pain. Yeah. It never really just turns off one day. It's a slow progression. I'm sure you're yeah. peeling the onion, et cetera. But tracking it really validates it. So I think it's been such, such a powerful tool for our patients. So I'm Yay. beyond grateful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And even also to be able to look back and see that you had good days on the bad days when you have lost hope and you're feeling discouraged and you feel that you're going to have pain forever, you can actually have a physical platform that you can look back and see, oh, well, I was feeling good on those days and, and I will feel that way again in the future. It's Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you two things. One is we were very worried we would only get like, today was a bad day, a bad day, a bad day. And that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really this very nice distribution of like great days to terrible days, but there are great days in there. And I'm sure, as you said, it feels good. The other thing that we really appreciate is that there is a diary uh, option in, in the app. And people have been putting like the birth of their kids and all these very beautiful memories throughout uh, the days that you can track. And it's a really, you know, it's very rewarding and it's kind of nice to see that they're thinking also about the good experiences of their life rather than just the end of symptoms. Right. Yeah, no, and another point clinically, it helps us, what is your flair? You were doing so well and sometimes it's, I had what you ate. Sometimes it's you had some constipation. Other times you were sitting at work and on a yeah. hard chair. So yeah. it really yeah. helps us understand clinically what can flare a patient and really how to help change their lifestyle, behavioral modification and lifestyle. So it's fabulous. Thanks. <laughs> how can people contact you if they have any questions or just want to talk to you about further? Yeah. So we have, uh, the best way is to email us. So we are citizenendo at columbia.edu. Uh, we are on Twitter, we're on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, search for Citizen Endo and you should find us. Uh, yeah, and Good please job. contact us, we love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for really being a leader in this valuable research that will one day benefit and is right now benefiting so many people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. If you can relate to this video, please leave a comment below and share this with anyone else who you think may benefit. Thank you. Mm -hmm.